proving the success of the diversion programs we've been able to establish to date in about 650 of our restaurant locations. So really looking forward to some further collaboration and action items that come out of the CUP Summit and this chat today. I mean, the, the notion of, of what we call pre-competitive work is, is pretty key to, to success here. Um, these guys are fierce competitors of ours, and, and you know the other folks in the room are fierce competitors of ours, and there's, there's folks from paper mills who are fierce competitors of each other and, and vying for business, you know, and, and really vying for, for a piece of the puzzle, but, but the willingness of the system and the willingness of these competitors to come together um, for a common initiative is, is something that I think has been one of the, the shining achievements of, of this process. And essentially a model, you know, Peter's our, our guru in system syncing, essentially a model for moving forward of, of how to solve big issues across our industry sector. Um, mentioning paper mills, uh, John Mulcahy from Georgia Pacific, introduce yourself if you could. Yeah, thanks, Jim. My name is John Mulcahy, and I work with uh, George Civic Professional in Atlanta, responsible for sustainability, corporate social responsibility, and commercial compliance. Uh, we provide uh, cups to uh, customers like Tim Hortons, uh, as well as we provide napkins, towel, and tissue for Starbucks, and we make those products out of uh, a host of different recycled uh, materials, including uh, post consumer Okay. And, uh, yeah, I mean, John, you mentioned that Starbucks, you're, you're actually producing all of our napkins for our U.S. markets right now. So uh, we're running some, some tests right now in, in the city of Chicago where we just introduced customer-facing recycling. You may have seen it if you're a resident of Chicago. And, you know, we're, we're collecting the cups in that market and we're, we're sending them up to John's Mill to be turned essentially into Starbucks napkins. You know, and, and that's our ultimate goal is, is what a cool day it will be if we, if we can actually print on Starbucks napkins made from old Starbucks cups. Um, and what a great day it will be if I can actually print on this someday made from old Starbucks cups. That's the kind of uh, closed-loop system we're trying to achieve here and, and moving forward. And you know, with partners like Georgia Pacific and the others in the paper industry who are really innovating to find good solutions, um, we're, we're seeing that kind of that progress and movement. So last but not least is uh, my friend Joe Burke from Action Carding in New York. Um, Joe, tell us what you do. Joe is not on mic, so I'll introduce Joe. That, that pretty face you'd see down on the end there is, is Joe Burke. And uh, Action Carding is really the, the company in New York that, that provides all of our, our waste collection recycling services at our stores. And, you know, these, these are the guys on the ground. These are the guys in the trenches really providing services for us, taking our recyclables out of the stores, having to deal with, with a lot of the, the, the things we produce in our stores and, and the commodities we produce in our stores, um, and, and finding markets for, the, for those products, you know. Joe's group, they, they're the ones hauling the trucks, um, you know, in, in the middle of the night in, in New York City. They're the ones taking the material off the streets for us. They're taking them into their centralized facilities and they're, you know, they're essentially processing those materials and, and reselling those, those recyclable commodities um, to the highest bidder. And, and um, your, your participation, your industry's participation is very key, so appreciate it. I think you have a mic now. We, we, we appreciate it and we're uh, very happy to be involved with Starbucks uh, to see it come uh, where it has gone. Since the very beginning, is, is tremendous. Uh, when we first started out, we did a pilot program at seven locations, yep. and now to see all this progress on the walls and how many different people are involved, it's it's just a it's, it's an amazing process. So we're very glad to be involved. Now, Joe, I know I know you New, York, New Yorkers like to talk with your hands, but uh, if you could keep that microphone up near your face, we'll. I got it. I got <laughs> those, it. Those folks out in the blog <laughs> will be able to hear you. So thank okay. you. Okay. Appreciate it. So um, you know we're gonna we're gonna take questions from from you all out there in the virtual world. Um, so start sending your questions in right now. And uh, Brad, what's, what's the hash sign for that? Uh, Pound Cup Summit. Pound Cup Summit is where you send your questions in on Twitter. Um, also on the Starbucks Facebook account, you can, you can find it that way. So many avenues to send your questions in to this, this esteemed panel of colleagues here um, who, are, who are skipping their lunch for us. Thank you very much. So you know, one of the first questions I have is, is this notion of collaboration and this notion of scale. Um, Back in the back room, or back in the room behind us, we've really been talking about the need for scale. And um, John shares a statistic all the time, which is so impressive for me. Is his paper mill up in Green Bay, Wisconsin? Go Packers! You won last night. Good job. But you know, his paper mill up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, he said he could take in all the Starbucks cups generated in the world, and that would be like four days worth of paper for his mill. So you know, the notion that yeah, there's four billion Starbucks cups out there every year that we generate. But that's not a lot to a paper company, you know, and the, the desire and the need for scale is what we're really talking about is the most important aspect here. Um, John, how do, we, how do we achieve scale? Well, you know, as we talk all along, I mean, during the course of a trial, you can always force a, a commodity through a mill, but 
in order for this process to be sustainable, one of the things that we've talked about is the yielded cost of that fiber. So how much does that fiber cost Georgia Pacific, for example, to make tissue product out of compared to other sources of, of fiber that are available for us? And so in order to make that economical, the, the fiber in a cup is, is beautiful fiber to a recycled paper maker. It's virgin softwood, long fiber, uh, makes great tissue products out of it. But there needs to be enough of it to generate the scale, to keep the cost down low enough so that my mill managers are interested in, in purchasing it. And so we're starting with Chicago, which can generate a certain amount of cups, but the, the amount of cups generated in one city from one operator is not enough in and of itself to make it economical for uh, a mill like ours or a company like ours. We need to build that scale in order to get that cost down and make competitive with other sources of fiber. Well, thank, thank you for calling our cups beautiful. I appreciate that. Uh, I happen to agree that those are beautiful <laughs> cups. But, um, yeah, and that's, that's one of the reasons, really, that, that you know, I think we've enlisted um, basically not the support, but enlisted the, the enthusiasm of fellow retailers out there. Um, Carol, talk to us about, about how it was with your company to actually go to your bosses and say, we want to work with our competitors on this issue, and, and what sort of buy-off you got from, from that, that, that conversation. Well, I think a good example of how collaboration on these issues really does work to promote success of the initiative is if you take the example of our implementation of a cup recycling program in Toronto in 2008. That started with restaurants specifically in Toronto with one waste management partner that was willing to take the cups and work with innovative mills that were willing to accept it and turn it into a recyclable product. And then as we saw that grow, we saw retailers coming on board, other retailers coming on board to build that volume, and also other waste management companies that were willing to come on board to take the material because there was a desire to have that material in the marketplace. So now when we run mill trials and we are looking to try and learn more about how we can recycle cups, it's always the Toronto slash Ontario market that's okay. providing the cups for those trials and learning. So if you take that sort of as a microcosm of what could be if we collaborated and ensured that all retailers right. and all waste yeah. industries were taking the same materials, it's a perfect example of how collaboration can work to build volume and to have a marketable product. So in terms of needing to make a sell, I think yep. that, that example in and of itself is a great way of looking at it. Excellent, excellent. So Peter, we, we use this term of systems thinking um, and systems approach to to discuss how we're trying to solve this issue. Can you give us a 30 second primer on what systems thinking is and why it's important and applicable to this ende endeavor? Well, everybody so far has been illustrating it again and again. It, it really just starts with saying, oh, what are, who are all people who've got to work together to accomplish something? Uh, the cup is a thing, but it operates in a system. It's manufactured, uh, you use it, it goes someplace, it always goes someplace. Right. The question is where. And if we really want it to work like any kind of natural system, we want it to move in cycles. You know, there's no waste in nature. Everything moves in cycles. Everything is being, material is always being reused. Um, it's only us that kind of think we can work in this linear system where we make it, we use it, we throw it away. And there's no consequence. There's not a lot more ways out there. So that's one simple way to define systems thinking, when the aways go away. Right. It was, it was really interesting when we started this recycle, recyclable cup process. Um, the first thing we jumped to and the first solution we all jumped to was what can we make this cup out of that's going to make it recyclable? You know, what's, what's the silver bullet? What's the perfect material out there that we can make this cup out of that's going to make it recyclable? And we quickly discovered that there is no perfect cup. There is no perfect solution out there. What it really is is, and I referred to this earlier, is the infrastructure for recycling is what really needs to exist and, and, and a customer's ability to actually throw, uh, recycle our cups when they're done using it those are the things that don't exist today, regardless of what the cups are made out of. And you know, that's one of the key points that we've tried to focus on at our three cup summits is, is let's find holes in the infrastructure and let's shoot, attempt to fill those holes. Um, Joe Burke uh, with Action Carding, you guys provide all the recycling services for us in the, in the city of New York and in, in Manhattan. Um, you know, tell us about the best approach you see to actually increasing the volume of, of materials, increasing the volume of cups. and, and quality of those materials because I think that's really key for folks like you who are on the ground managing these materials 
what can companies like Starbucks and Tim Hortons and McDonald's and others do to really help you increase the quality of material that you're seeing? Um, at, at this point, through the uh, studies that we had done, um, and we've had this conversation, what, what we feel is that by collecting the, the cups in a clear plastic bag within your facility by, by the consumer, you know, in front of the house, um, and having that monitored by the, uh, the people who are working for Starbucks in the back of the house and they're controlling it from a store management type of uh, atmosphere, they can clearly identify in these clear plastic bags if it's contaminated or if it's not contaminated. They can put it out with their mixed recyclables. I can send my mixed recyclable truck to the location to do the route, pick up the m materials and bring them back to my facility to be able to be sorted, bailed, and, and then you know, marketed as, as a product. So for us, um, basically what we would need is to not have contamination, which you're always gonna have. You're always gonna have a certain level of contamination. We spoke about this today. Our facility is permitted to have 15% contamination in the facility. So you can only have so much to, to work with while, while you're doing it. The, the liquids in a cup, if we could get the liquids out of the cup, it would make it a much better situation for us as far as recycling. But we've seen through the test that if there's a little bit of liquid in there, it's not gonna contaminate the whole entire bale or load that you're sending to the mill to be able to make the product. Right? So as far as um, if, if what we, through the, uh, the, the trials, we've done that, and I think by implementing the, uh, the, the, the approach of the clear plastic bag and, and having your, your management viewing it, putting everything together, I think we could, we could actually advance the ball even further from this point. I sure. Just underscore one thing that Joe just said, uh, because obviously we're all part of the system. Uh, and, and another way to kind of define system thinking is I'm always operating within some system, 90% of which I'm paying no attention to. So, when I'm about to throw my cup away, if I think of Joe, and one of my jobs is to make Joe's business successful, because none of this works. Right. If the, re, if the people who gather the stuff and recycle it can't sell it. So if Absolutely. I know that emptying out my cup, which is, takes like all of like one second, <laughs> will help make Joe's business successful, which will make the whole recycling thing work, right. then boom. I'm That's now it. paying attention to a part of the system I was ignoring before. Yep. And, and Jim had mentioned in the beginning of the uh, conversation that it's not so much just the cup that's going to be left in the Starbucks location. Sure. It's going to be all these cups that are going all over the New York City, the country, yep. wherever it's going to be, Tim Hortons, wherever these cups wind up. To your point, if they empty that cup out and they throw it in a mixed paper container, which is in almost every office building all over New York City, people, are, they're recycling their paper that product goes into that waste stream and comes to our facility, it's going to get recycled. You know, this, this, this notion of what we call shared responsibility, I think, is key. And um, for us, um, not only do we all play a role in success here, but the customers play a, a significant role in success here. When, when a Tim Hortons customer or a Starbucks customer is at that decision point of throwing something away, um, you know, take a look at the best place to put that. Take a look at what needs to happen to that. Um, because, you know, what we call garbage and what we call recyclables, these are commodities for, for companies like Joe. These are valuable products for, for companies that, like Georgia Pacific and John. These are things that they're buying as, as feedstocks into their systems. And whatever we can do as consumers, and I point to myself because I'm consuming, is that um, you know, take that extra second to think about the decision. As Peter mentioned, you know, when I'm throwing my cup away, if I think about Joe and, uh, and the impact that that's going to have on him, um, I might take that extra second to do just the one thing that makes it a more valuable commodity. So we're going to take some questions, uh, questions from the virtual community out here. This one's coming from uh, Steve Wood Say, and it says, why do you use number five plastics for your cold cups instead of number one or number two, which are more accepted for local recycling programs? Steve, this is a great question that we, we often get. Um, you know, if you, if you look at recycling systems for plastic in general, a lot of systems around the country and around the world, um, they only take sort of the number one soda soda containers. I mean, I'm in Boston, so I say soda. Out on the West Coast, we call it pop. But, it's Coke um, in Atlanta. Yeah, it's Coke, or, Coke in Atlanta. Isn't that crazy? It's Coke no matter what it is, it's Coke, right? So, <laughs> but, um, so the question is, is why, why did you convert your cups to number five plastic? We made the decision about two years ago to convert all of our cold plastic cups to what's called polypropylene, or, or you see a number five on the bottom of that. Um, the reason we did that is, we look at the total environmental footprint of our cups from basically cradle to grave, you know, manufacturing and raw materials and disposal and all these things. And you know, what we were discovering was that on the manufacturing side, by switching to polypropylene, we significantly reduced the carbon footprint of those cups um, by over 45% from, from the previous material. Um, and from the recycling perspective though, 
uh, the industry out there and, uh, understands that, that number ones and number two plastics, when we talk about number ones and number twos, what we're really only talking about in the recycling industry, and Joey, you're a better, better advocate of this, is we're talking about soda, soda bottles and we're talking about milk jugs generally. And all the other plastics are generally combined into what's called mixed bales, you know, of, of plastics. Um, so even if a cup, even if a thermal form cup, there's a, there's a wonky, geeky term, isn't it? But even if a plastic cup is made out of a number one plastic, because it's not made out of a bottle grade number one plastic, the, in, the, the recycling industry generally wants, doesn't want it and wants to put it into a mixed grade. So, you know, this, this misperception, I think, around the numbers on plastics, uh, can you talk a bit about that? I mean, we're, we're, at our MRF right now, we're taking uh, one through seven. We're taking all the uh, all the uh, the mixed recyclables, and we're recycling it all together. We, right. We do Yankee Stadium, City Field, so we're getting a, uh, a big volumes of these different types of uh, you know soda bottles, like you like to say, water bottles. And what we do is we, we make the bale with the mix, and then right. we make a rigid plastic as well. Yep. So if wh whether it's a one or a five, it's going to all go into the same bale yeah. and be sold. So it's very doable because you do it. Yep. Why isn't it done more widely? I, I mean, I can't answer that question. I know that when the material is coming back to armor, we're trying to capture that, make a bail out of it, and, and sell it as a, as a product. Because if not, then we're going to have to pay disposal fee to be able to get it out the door. So it just makes more sense for us to be able to, to, to bail. Why it's not being done uh, widespread is maybe they don't have the sorting capacity at some of these different facilities. And, uh, or, you know, maybe they're not uh, focused on trying to get secure that type of material, and it might be going into residual. I'm not, I'm not sure what everyone else is, is doing, but in sure. regards to what we're doing at the, at the, at the MRF, that's what we want to do because it just makes sense. So, Joe, if I could ask you a favor, um, don't mention the Yankees again in Boston because <laughs> somebody's going to come pitch hey, us off the road here. This is a long drop. We're, we're six stories up here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, another question here. Um, um, do you have any volume targets? Our volume is is 100%. Um, you know, our volume is that is that 100% of our cups are recyclable. And again, as I mentioned earlier, when I talk about recycling recyclable cups, that means our customers have access to recycling services. Um, it's a tough goal, you know, and, and we only have a few years left to reach that goal. But I think with the help and the scale we're seeing from the industry here, uh, we're well on our way to achieving that goal. So yes, our volume targets are, are 100%, and uh, we'll see if we get there. If I could comment on yep, please do. one part related to that as well is the fact whether it's Starbucks or Tim Hortons or, or other quick service restaurants is that the majority of the people, when they order their coffee, they walk out the store with it. So if yep. you start thinking about it in terms of systems, we need to start thinking about not only what can we do inside the Starbucks store, inside the Tim Hortons store, in order to increase the amount of recycling that takes place, but think about where those people go after they get their coffee, whether they go to a school or an office building or home, and we need to help work on collecting those cups as well. So, so uh, the This question is from uh, TMP Almer 11. It says, why are we not offering more than a 10 cent discount to help encourage customers to bring in their own tumblers? You know, we've, we've been offering a 10 cent discount, um, actually one of the first, first companies to do that, for people to actually bring their own tumblers or commuter mugs into our stores and, uh, and use those instead of, instead of one of our takeaway single serve cups. And, um, you know, I think what we've discovered is that, and we'll be very transparent here, that that 10 cent discount has never been a good driver for behavior change. And it's never been a good enough incentive for people to actually um, en masse change, change their behaviors to bring in more, more of their uh, tumblers. And I think there's some good lessons to learn from, from the grocery industry who have very successfully, through positive incentives, um, have been able to get a pretty large quantity of, of their customers to start bringing in more reusable uh, grocery bags into the sector. So the promise to make to you all is that we are looking deeply into figure out, figuring out what actually drives our customers and what are the barriers to our customers actually bringing in their own their own mugs into into our stores um, to be used in our stores you know and it's it's the typical thing it's like oh i forgot my mug and i don't want to buy another one because i already have 30 mugs in my car or 30 mugs at home and and i just forgot to bring one this time or it's you know it's it, it it's dirty it doesn't feel clean and we have ways of, of addressing that and washing those mugs in the store but um the answer is we don't have a golden solution to that one yet we don't know yet what's going to get customers, more of our customers to bring uh, more tumblers into the store. But we're running some really cool tests to do that. Um, 
we actually sponsored a contest about a year and a half ago called the Beta Cup Challenge, where uh, we we deployed the uh, the the technology of crowdsourcing to really help the the webosphere and, and the blogosphere help us understand you know what they think were the best drivers for for bringing in more more of their commuter bugs. And we got some amazing ideas out of that around cup design, around incentives, around all these other things. Um, but what we also discovered was that simply offering a larger discount doesn't necessarily have an impact on, on getting more people to do it um, until you actually hit, what, a dollar discount or something like that. And then, well, then we become, quickly become a nonprofit company. So we, we're not going down that road. But it's, it's really exciting to see that interest and that level of us increasing our use of, of commuter mugs. And uh, we're working on that for sure. So next question, how does Starbucks manage its environmental impact on its supply chain side? That's a good, good question. That's a deep question. That's from Lee Haug. Um, on the environmental side, the, uh, the notion of life cycle impacts is becoming more and more prevalent in, in our everyday discussion. And if you're not familiar with what a life cycle impact or an LCA is, it's essentially measuring the entire environmental impact from cradle to grave of any product. Currently, it's a very expensive process. Um, we ran a, an LCA on our cold cups, and uh, you know we spent in upwards of $100,000 on, on that LCA. So, so the, the notion of running an LCA on, on the thousands and thousands of things we sell in our stores, I think, is relatively complex. But what we're seeing is, is more and more movement toward this common goal and this, this common set of data around measuring the environmental impact of supply chain and packaging. So we're, we're encouraging tapping into that, that supply chain, tapping into those common sources of data so that we can all make decisions around the best environmental impact from the packaging on the sourcing side. And that's a great question because companies need to be looking at their total environmental footprint. You know, and, and I've seen the report from Tim Hortons, I've seen a report from Georgia Pacific and others, where you're really looking at the entire footprint of your company across the sectors. And it's, you know, it's, it's interesting the things you find when you're measuring your footprint that you are, are, are hidden as huge impacts on your footprint that you need to, to learn to mitigate. But uh, again, that's, that's an issue that companies are focusing on globally, is mitigating the impact of their supply chain. And, you know, frankly, coffee companies are sourcing a significant majority of their supply chain, i.e. coffee beans, um, from developing worlds around the country. So the notion of how we treat those coffee farmers and the notion of the environmental impact that we have on those coffee farmers around the world is, is very key to us uh, to make sure that they maintain their lifestyles and, and are able to actually be healthy, productive farmers. Good question. So I feel like I'm dominating all the conversation here. Um, we'll, we'll go back to the questions in a moment. But... Um, Carol, you did a presentation today on, on bin design, and you know what I've discovered really, and what we're discovering in our in our Starbucks stores is that is that, and Joe touched on it earlier, this this notion of of involving the customers um, in this process and involving customers in success. I think Tim Hortons has done a great job from you know the way you do outreach to your customers to the way you design your bins in your stores to be simple and effective and efficient. Um, and I think we have a lot of learning as a, as an industry to um, for that process. Can you spend two minutes and talk about that a bit? Sure, absolutely. I'm glad to share the journey we've taken there. We've, we're probably on about the third generation of the units that we're using in our restaurants to uh, engage our, in both our guests as well as our team members so that they know specifically what's being asked of them every time they're making a decision at the end of, of their stay at our restaurants or also making them available in the drive-through. So a lot of what's been built into the units, uh, we use a unit that's designed by a company known as Clean River in the industry. They use uh, recycled plastic right into the unit that they design so that at least we're closing the loop on some plastic recycling on that side. But also just making sure that we have flexible signage so that we can make it specific to that particular market, to the guests in that area, being using both pictures as well as text on there so that if somebody's just quickly taking a look at the, what they have to do, they'll see where the coffee cup goes, they'll see where their water bottle goes and whether that's two different uh, openings. So we have different style of openings too to cue the guests that there are different things that are happening. So there's a square for waste, there's a Saturn for paper and recyclables. So all different visual cues to sort of say I need to stop, pause for a second and decide what it is I'm going to do with the waste that I have um, at the end of my stay. And in terms of trying to maintain integrity of products, we've added a hood to the drive through units to make sure that our paper is not getting soaked in rain or snow north of the border. And um, really also beyond that, trying to have our team members engage with our guests, whether that be uh, in the drive through because we know, you know, the people on the go, they're, 
they have just a, a small amount of time to make that decision. So uh, we have owners on the East Coast that actually do these waste reduction Wednesdays where they put team members in the drive through to just cue people to say, you know, did you know you can recycle your cup here and here's how you do it properly. So just sort of that ongoing engagement and particularly where we are recycling the cup but the guests can't do it at home so that they know we are making an effort at our location. So, so the unit really, it's the flexibility of the unit, uh, using the visual cues, and also just the idea that we could change it if we needed to change it rather quickly just by changing signage. I think we have a lot to learn from you guys. And so next time you're in Canada, uh, head into Tim's store and check out, check out their really cool recycling bins, and then head across the street and buy a cup of Starbucks. So. <laughs> <laughs> So next question is, how can we transform people's way of thinking from a linear system to a more cyclical and sustainable system? This is from Tay Miller 92. Peter, you want to answer that one? Well, I, I think the, uh, it starts, that's why I gave the example before, you know, think about Joe with his recycling business. You know, you just pick any part of the system you're part of, which you're not normally paying attention to, and you pay attention to it. You know, somebody makes the thing, in this particular case, um, to me, I think the most important thing for all of us to think about is somebody is trying to make a business out of what to do after you've used the thing. And if there's not a good business for that, it's just not going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen because of some great philanthropic gesture. The cities aren't going to be able to afford to make the investments. Nobody will. So I think that it's, it's that simple. But it always helps to personalize it. That's why I use the example of pointing at Joe. And I have to say, the point of the guy who's talking about the Yankees sitting here in Boston, I want you to know, I'm, I'm really serious about this. Um, I but you secretly like the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> now i got to be really careful on that. No comment on that. Uh, but I think that you just think of the people who are affected, and the more you can personalize it, the more it, it's real to you. Because the system is such an abstraction. But there's always people involved. Like, I got involved with these guys initially with their sourcing work. When you really start to see the situation of coffee growers in communities around the world, you'd have a totally different concept of your coffee. You think about who grew those beans and what's their livelihood and what's the environmental and social conditions in which they're living. And you actually want to make sure you buy a cup of coffee that will assure the livelihoods of the people who grew the coffee. So that's, again, the same point. You've got to make it real by thinking of the individuals. Agreed. Agreed. So... And, you know, when you talk about cups themselves, I mean, those, those individual decisions within the system are so key, I think, to success. And, you know, what we can do as retailers is we can purchase materials that have post-consumer fiber uh, content in those to really help close the, the loop on the system and create a demand for post-consumer fiber. John, what, what else can we be doing as, as retailers, I think, um, for you as a paper industry person to, to add more value to you, to your system and your stream? So as far as the input of recycled cut fiber into a mill system, there are two things that are, uh, that are important. One is the, uh, the level of contamination. So, and by contamination, I'm specifically referring to anything that's not cut. Right. And contamination for in-store recycling can occur really by two different parties. One are the, the customers themselves. And uh, what we've seen in addition to the paper cups is you'll see the occasional plastic cup and lid and straw and that sort of thing. And, and we as a paper manufacturer need to recognize that there's only so much influence over consumer behavior that uh, we can really have. And so we've got to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, but the contamination can also come from the, the Starbucks partners, the employees who are in the store. And I think with the adequate training programs and signage and that sort of thing, we can significantly reduce that amount of contamination, which will make it easier on the MRFs and therefore create a better product for us. Uh, the second thing that I think is important is a, a level of transparency in terms of what is in the bale of paper that's coming to the mill. So if I think about George Pacific, we've got three major paper types. We've got mills that produce uh, brown paper to four corrugated boxes. We've got mills that produce copy paper, and we've got mills that produce recycled uh, talon tissue and, and napkins. Each of those mills, which I think is relatively representative for our industry, are set up differently with the technologies that they've invested in for the type of paper that they typically get. And so what we've seen in our system is that tissue mills, which have historically gone deeper into the waste stream to get at paper, have already invested in the technology to separate the polyethylene from the paper and can handle that quite easily, where our copy paper business and our 
brown box business has not. So those three mills need the right level of transparency to know what they're getting so that they can use that fiber efficiently. So I think those are the two big things. So if I could be a, a translation for some of the things John said. When we talk about fiber, uh, we're not talking about a brand muffin here. We're talking about paper <laughs> fiber. And, and that's really the, the key feedstock for, for your mills. Um, you know, and, and, and this concept of, of brown versus white versus tissue, you know, there's, there's, there are a lot of paper mills in North America. And there are a lot of paper mills around the world. Um, and, you know, they're set up to take very specific products and very specific materials. And I toured John's paper mill in Green Bay um, last year, as you mentioned. And, um, you know, the, the paper makers that they're called, they actually have paper makers at these mills. These guys are like chefs. And they have a recipe for their paper, you know. And, and, and if they don't get that recipe right, you know, the, the millions of feet of paper that are coming out of these machines so, at such a high rate, um, it's not right. And you got to start over. And you got to scrap that stuff and start over. So, you know, our ability to make sure we can get your recipe right, I think is, is key to us uh, throughout the system. Right. And I think that's another good point as it relates to this product. I, I mentioned early on that the quality of the wood fiber that's in the cup is of high value and ideally would go towards the, the higher end of the scale of the different types of, of paper grades. However, we need to recognize both the amount of it as well as the condition that it may come in. And instead of trying to force it to the highest value grade, you may want to start with the, the, the lower quality grade. And what will happen is over time, as recyclers and paper makers recognize that there are, is higher value items in that bale, that we individually will invest in technologies that will allow us to pick that out because we can generate or you can get a higher revenue and we're willing to pay a higher price for higher quality fiber. So instead of trying to get all the way to the end, yep what are the right steps in place to get the material flowing, develop the scale, and then provide opportunities for MRFs and uh, uh, paper makers to make the appropriate investments to, to deal with the higher value stuff. Absolutely. John, if, if I could uh, just follow up that with a question, because when you first were telling the story of the cups from Chicago getting collected and going to the mill in Wisconsin and coming back as tissue for the store. Right. You know, in my mind, I said, well, okay, well, that's great. You've slowed down the process of the paper, that fiber going into a, um, a landfill by one stage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's now temporarily in the form of a tissue. Mm -hmm. right. I'm assuming almost all those tissues are going to end up in a landfill. Is that right or not? Paper or wood fiber is a little bit different than plastic in terms that there is a number of times that it can effectively be recycled before the integrity of the fiber degrades. So, some of the numbers I've heard from an industry standpoint are around seven is the, is the number of times that it can go back through the system before the fiber is so bad that it won't make it through the, uh, through the system. So okay. you, it's a little bit different from, from plastic, but it can be recycled multiple times, but it cannot be and, recycled. And can right. it be recycled realistically if it's in the form of a tissue? It can be recycled to... technically when it's in the form of a tissue, a, uh, a, a, a used napkin which is uh, where we're trying to drive the, uh, the, the cups in our Green Bay mill, right. is typically going to have in use level of contamination, whether it's ketchup and that sort of thing, as well as the bin that it's going to go into. Right. There's not really an efficient way today to, to separate that out. But when you're, one of the dynamics that's going on in the industry is the level of supply and demand for recycled products. As Different industries are contracting, whether it's the newsprint industry, the printing and writing industry. At the same time, the demand for recycled material is increasing, uh, particularly with our export market, which means that that fiber becomes more valuable. As it does, which is really the, the, our incentive in this process, is how can we go and get good fiber that we don't currently get today? Cups are certainly easier than napkins. But I could envision the day that people like George Pacific and Murphs and, and those folks will find enough value or see enough opportunity to justify the investment in technology to figure out how to get that fiber out of the napkin. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks. What's a Murph? So uh, a Murph is a, a materials <laughs> recovery facility uh, where, you know, that's, a, that's the kind of facility that Joe's, Joe's group is running where we actually bring products in a mixed form usually. And, uh, you know, if you've, ever, if you've ever toured a Murph before, it's, 
pretty interesting stuff. I mean, tell us tell us about what happens at a MRF. Uh, basically, at, at, uh, at, at our MRF, the material comes back to our facility and uh, it comes back in clear plastic bags. Clear plastic bags are broken, ripped open, run up a belt, and it gets sorted out and dropped into lower bays. Yep. Got it. Interference on No worries. Um, so at our, at our MRF, uh, there's a couple different ways where we're sorting uh, different types of uh, materials, uh, but we basically have a, a star screen uh, where the smaller materials are, will drop through onto a lower belt, larger cardboard will go over the top and, and be bailed. We also have a, a manual uh, sorting process at the facility as well. We, we can recycle um, mixed paper, cardboard, white paper, plastic from bottles. Uh, we also have a... Uh, Polarizer on the end of our our, uh, our Murph that basically uh, shoots off the uh, to tin cans that we get from the stadiums or, or anywhere else for that matter, so we can recycle the aluminum in bales. So uh, the Murph is a material recovery facility where all this material gets separated, sorted, baled, and, and, and is prepared to be able to uh, to be sold to the mills so that they could utilize it for um, their end use. Ah, we're down to one microphone here. It's amazing. So we only have a couple minutes left, and I just want to take one more question. This is from, uh, well, these Twitter handles are crazy. Uh, age, all right, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this one. It's something to cracker, but it's, it's a really good name. So, so the question is, how does Starbucks take into consideration the 747 ideas posted on mystarbucksidea.com? You know, if you're not familiar with my Starbucks idea, it was, a, it was a project generated from our digital team a couple years ago. And the notion of it was, how do we directly engage our customer into the decision-making process as a company? How do we directly get feedback from our customer base on what the company's doing right, what, what's doing wrong, and where are the missing links? And to date, we have, we have actually implemented over 175 of the ideas that have come straight from our customer base um, when it comes to, to from my Starbucks idea. So if... I encourage you to log on to mystarbucksidea.com. Look at some of the ideas that are already posted on there. As, a, as a, the message mentioned, there have been over 750 so far. And you know we take those very seriously as a company. We look at what, what the customers are voting on as their most important issues, and, uh, and we implement those. And we, we find ways to implement those in our stores. Some great examples of that are you know we, we're now offering gluten-free uh, pastries, which we've never done in the past. That came directly from my Starbucks idea. Um, you know, we're offering all, all kind of other new products and services in the stores came directly from my Starbucks idea. And I know that a lot of you actually gave a whole lot of information um, and have a lot of questions that have been posted online. So that's a great conduit for you is to go to mystarbucksidea.com and actually check that out, post your questions there and post your comments there. Hey Joe, one of your garbage trucks is going by in the background here. <laughs> Sorry for the noise. So I want to give um, our panelists, again, we only have a couple minutes, but sort of one last nugget and one last thought you know, that, that's most important to you and, and the takeaway for, for the thousands of people who are listening out there and, and where you really see success going, where you see this, this Starbucks Cup initiative going into the future. And I'll put Peter on the spot first. I was going to volunteer to go last. Um, but uh, I think that if you could be here, you would see a lot of folks um, really starting to work together. And it includes people who otherwise would be competing with each other as well as people who work already are connected across these supply chains but don't really work together with uh, any kind of common focus other than what their business requires. So I think that um, what I've taken away from all this is the desire to really bring about change is very strong. Thank you. I would say that um, certainly the the efforts and the strides that everyone's made in terms of collaboration just furthers everybody's end goal of diverting the cup. I think the wonderful thing is that I find, at least in, in Canada and with our business, we're being challenged a lot less on whether or not the cup is recyclable in its current form. We are now being approached more to say, how is it that you are being successful in recycling the cup, both from the municipal side as well as from our colleagues, to say, you know, we can move this forward. And I think collaborative events such as this one and what's happening with um, other industry associations will certainly continue that goal. And uh, we're really looking forward to participating in that. Thank you, Carol. I guess the comment I'd like to make is that in order for this to be successful, it must be sustainable. And the way we define sustainability is a mix of the dimensions of social, economic, 
and environmental. And you have to think about that all the way across the supply chain, whether it's the operator, the consumer, the operator, the waste hauler, the material recycling facility, or the tissue mill. For each one of those participants, they need to see an economic reason, a sustainable reason for this to make sense, or they're going to opt out and it's not going to be successful. So we're very encouraged that along the way that that can be built. But in order for this to be sustainable, it, it does need to balance all those factors. Thank you, John. Uh, to uh, John's point earlier about the, um, the fiber being um, uh, valuable in the cup itself, but us not being able to have um, uh, large quantities of the cup, um, what, I'd, what I'd like to kind of say is my uh, last and final note here is that in, in the future, five years, ten years from now, it would be a great thing if all these hot cups that we're seeing are winding up in the mixed recyclables or in their own waste stream and not just Starbucks or uh, Tim Hortons, but all hot cups. Think about how many people are drinking coffee uh, every day of their life and those cups are just going right into the landfill. So this... Um, mission to, to be able to achieve that is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a substantial mission, and I, I, I feel that um, we're moving in the right direction. So, so as, I think as a final thought, I'll say, you know, what can you do as home, at home as a, as a customer of not only Starbucks, but just as a general consumer of, of the world? And, you know, there's, there's several things that come to mind for me when that question is posed is, First, you know, you need to choose as a, as a consumer how to spend your dollar. And you make choices every day by voting with your dollars um, on, on the choices you make on who to shop with, what to buy, and where to buy it from. And, and frankly, you know, what we're asking for is if, if you have an ethic around sustainability, um, if you have an ethic around environmentalism, if you have an ethic around, around businesses doing the right thing, then spend your dollar at those businesses, you know, and, and go to Tim Hortons in Canada, and go to Starbucks, and, and go to the companies that are doing the right thing. And at the same time, keep us on our toes. You know, if you walk into a Starbucks store um, and you're seeing a practice that you don't think, um, you know, aligns with our values and our mission, let the manager know and, and ask questions. Um, and, you know, that manager will be happy to explain, you know, what's going on in that store. And, and you know, we're a very transparent company, and we believe in, in, in the input of our customers. So, if something doesn't feel right, you know, ask that question. At the same time, you know, we are not recycling in a lot of our stores today because the infrastructure doesn't yet exist to do that. And there are a number of reasons that we all talked about on this panel today is why that infrastructure doesn't yet exist. Um, but what you can also do as, as a consumer and as a citizen within your community is ask your local policymakers and your local elected officials, you know, why is there no infrastructure for recycling for, for this product in my community if there isn't? Um, you know, and they'll listen to you because we all share the common goal of, of diverting these materials from the waste stream and actually creating value for these materials um, in the long run from a market perspective and from an environmental perspective. Um, and policymakers share that initiative too. So if there's no recycling in your community, whether it be at curbside or, or in the retail sector, ask questions as to why it's not happening and, and, and take, take action. And then finally, um, as, as Peter and Joe touched on, spend that extra one second in the decisions you make as a consumer when you're finished with this great beverage uh, because that will make a world of difference. Thanks again for logging on to our, to our fun webinar here from uh, MIT in Boston, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon.